they told me I'm next, so I'm here. Uh, let's have one more round of applause, please, for the orchestra. For Megan Mullins and Paul Hefner. And also the narration by Dr. Jonathan Eller. I'm going to let most of the other people, like Dr. Eller, do the talking tonight because they so, know so much more about Ray Bradbury than I do. I'm going to try and move this up. My name is Larry Yellen. I am a, a reporter, investigative reporter, legal analyst, and anchor for Channel 32 Fox News in Chicago. And the reason I was invited tonight is because I am from Waukegan. Some of you may remember, uh, if you're old enough like me with gray hair, uh, my grandfather in the 30s and 40s uh, started Yellen's Produce Company, which was right down below the hill beneath the Carnegie Library. And my father took it over, Morris Yellen, later on, uh, into the 60s. Uh, he made the front page of the uh, Waukegan News Sun twice because twice his chicken produce factory burned to the ground. <laughs> and he rebuilt it both times. And you may know me, I was a uh, graduate of Waukegan High School 1970. And, but most people who knew my dad just knew me as Maury's kid. So, I'm one of Maury's five kids. He passed away six years ago. He uh, was known, uh, for one thing, he could provide kosher chickens to all of our people in the Jewish community here, but he also provided chickens wholesale to all of the North Shore. And eventually was put out of business or uh, closed down when the uh, highway went through down there. But he was right down below the Carnegie Library. and. Uh, my connection to Waukegan then started, I was born in 1952, I think Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit came out in 1953 or so, so I was one year old when his first legendary uh, stories came out, and I'm just thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, I can't believe that the uh, city which once uh, caught me trespassing inside the law library has invited me back. <laughs> I will, uh, I'm used to, when I'm on television, I am used to uh, having an earpiece and the producer normally tells me, you've got 20 seconds, you've got 30 seconds, Larry, it's time to wrap it up. But tonight's even better, I have a big stop sign right here with flashing lights. And so I hopefully will not uh, extend this longer than uh, uh, it has to go. Uh, tonight you're going to hear from a number of people connected to the library and to Ray Bradbury who are deeply connected to furthering his place in American history. What a literary giant he was. What a guy to put Waukegan on the map. Uh, of course, the highlight will be unveiling this wonderful piece of art, which I am thrilled to see in person. And I think that uh, we'll try and keep things running on time because all of you are here to see the artwork and not to hear from us, I think. So let me begin by introducing the executive director of the library, Selena Gomez Belos. Selena? I was asking Selena to remind me when the library was built because I remember coming here when it was brand new. Uh, she said she thinks 1965, which means I would have been 13 which means up until that point I went to the Carnegie Library, which I do have some memories of doing. Uh, but my most famous moment in the library, and I say this because I know Ray Bradbury loved and worshipped libraries, was the day that the law library was opened in the county building. I don't remember the year, but I went in there to do some legal research as a young student, and the security officials came up and said, uh, I don't know who you are, but this library is not open yet and we have to take you into custody. <laughs> Hopefully that won't happen tonight. Okay. Thank you. I'm a little shorter, sorry. Uh, good evening. I thank you all for being here this evening. I always find it uh, a lot of fun when we can be loud in the library and we can do things differently on the street than park and drive. This is always very exciting to me. Uh, I want to make, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Like it's low. Okay. Uh, so thank you all for coming this evening. I hope that you're enjoy you've enjoyed the music and all friends and community here in Waukegan. Um, 
this is what we affectionately call Ray Bradbury's library. Uh, we are a few blocks of the Carnegie Library where he really did spend his childhood and, and reading in the library and, and, and just soaking up knowledge all the time. Um, what we do have is that this particular library, I'm told, is stood, stands on the ground where his elementary school once stood. So we do have quite the deep connection to Ray Bradbury here. Uh, Ray's love of libraries is very well known. He's really famous for insisting that he was educated in libraries because he lacked the resources to pursue a higher education. And so he read voraciously throughout his life in libraries. This is where he learned. And uh, in fact, throughout his, library, his life, not only was he a voracious reader, but he had been rented time on a typewriter. Do we all remember what a typewriter looks like? Uh, as he was an emerging writer, and we have one of his typewriters here at the library, so we invite you to come in and look at that uh, when we're open. <laughs> in recognition of the importance Waukegan Library held for him, Bradbury left his personal library and his last typewriter to us upon his death in 2012. You can see highlights of Ray Bradbury's collection on our main floor whenever the library is open. Ray recognized the vital role that libraries played in communities where access to educational resources is limited, and he knew firsthand what it took to overcome barriers to success. Our mission here at the library is to impact lives through literacy, speaks to this, this uh, uh, work that he did in his life. Through our innovative, award-winning service portfolio, we provide opportunity for community members of all ages to reach their goal through coming to the library. For some, that means finding a life-changing book. Others, like over, eight, over 900 individual adults who learn to better manage their health care, and over 250 unique learners who increase their computer skills. And of course, we can't forget the great story times and book discussions and people just sitting and enjoying a book here at the library. Waukegan Public Library is proud and honored to be the site of Zachary Oxman's monumental sculpture, Fantastical Traveler. We hope that this work, which so beautifully and energetically evokes Bradbury's passionate commitment to lifelong learning, inspires a new generation to come to the library in search of achieving their great dreams and generations and generations after that. And that they understand that the library is always ready to do as our mission states provide the path to empower and promote learning and discovery for everyone. We'd like to extend our deepest thanks to the Ray Bradbury Statue Committee. They have worked tirelessly these last five years. And in particular, co-chairs Richard Lee and Lori Nierheim for their tireless work to make the sculpture a reality. And to the more than 200 donors who's, without whose generous contributions the sculpture could not be here today. In addition, I would really like to thank the staff of the Waukegan Public Library because they really did chip in a lot of work uh, and to help bring this together to make sure that people were safe as it was being built, to make sure this party was a great party and this event is a great event. Uh, and they really deserve a lot of thanks also. I am really impressed that this community has come together to do this. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I've been here a year and a half and it's amazing to see what everybody has come together to honor this person and to honor this community and I'm just in awe of the whole thing. So I'm so pleased to be a part of this. Thank you all for coming this evening and I do hope you enjoy the rest of the program. stop sign is still flashing. <laughs> Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Eller. If you come up and uh, join us, and while you're coming up here, uh, Dr. Eller is the director of the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies at Indiana University in Indianapolis, where he curates the author's papers, awards, and memorabilia. He first met Ray Bradbury in the 1980s, developing a friendship and working relationship that led to three books about Mr. Bradbury's life and career. And I learned on the way here tonight that I also have a connection, a little bit distant, but it's also got a Waukegan connection. My older sister, Marlo Yellen, married a guy named Larry Beeman from the Beeman family, who some of you may have known. And I understand my sister reached out to me today and said, make sure and tell Dr. Eller that we're the ones who provided the, is it the Hope Chest? Yes. A piece of furniture? of his favorite cousin that my brother-in-law's family had somehow got their hands on. 
And they reached out to Dr. Eller, and he came to Bourbon A, where they now live, and he came and picked it up. So, yet another connection. Come tell us about it. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you tonight, uh, to be able to participate in the prelude with the symphony but also to put a little context tonight to the events and to the wonderful people that will follow me very shortly in this event. In 1962, Ray Bradbury reflected on his Waukegan years and the ideas that began to form in his creative imagination. When I was a boy in the Midwest, I used to go out and look at the stars at night and wonder about them. When I wasn't looking at the stars, I was running in my brand new tennis shoes on my way to swing in a tree, swim in a lake, or delve in the town library to read about dinosaurs or time machines. He made these remarks in his 42nd year as the author of seven story collections and novels that quickly defined his role as one of the best known and best loved storytellers of our time the edgy and emotionally powerful science fiction that shaped the Martian Chronicles and the Illustrated Man, the anti-authoritarian brilliance of Fahrenheit 451, the dark fantasies and supernatural terrors of otherness found in the October country, the fantasies and magical realism that emerged from the golden apples of the sun, the mixed terrors and joys of Waukegan childhood summers vividly recalled in dandelion wine, and Something Wicked This Way Comes, another novel of the Waukegan days that presents his most sustained exploration of the uncertain boundaries between good and evil, life and death. During his 70-year career, Ray Bradbury would receive an Academy Award nomination for animated film, two Emmys for television, the National Book Award for Lifetime Achievement, a Pulitzer Prize, and the National Medal of Arts. He was never able to attend college. In fact, he never really figured out how to learn in a lecture hall or classroom environment. His storytelling powers emerged early, and sometimes too often. He was occasionally banished to the hallway outside of his classrooms in Waukegan Central School, where the principal would fix him in her gaze and say, when are you going to learn to keep your mouth shut? In later years, she became quite proud of his achievements, but his secret source of early learning and his great passion for literature came from the Waukegan Public Library, then housed in the great curving bluff-top structure of the Carnegie Library on Sheridan Road. Bradbury recaptured these memories with Monday Night in Greentown, published in 1958 by the National Education Association for the very first National Library Week in America. He used very emotional metaphors to help generations of readers visualize the life-giving waters of his Waukegan library excursions. Ray Bradbury's words. The library was the great watering place where the animals, large and small, came from the night to drink and smile at each other across the green glass shadowed glades between the book mountains. So here you were, gamboling on spring nights like lambs, lolling like warm trout in whiny springs on summer nights, racing the curled mice leaves on autumn nights, always to the same Monday place, the same Monday building. You ran, you dawdled, you flew, but you got there. And there was always that special moment when, at the big doors, you paused before you opened them out, and went in among all those lives, in among all those whispers of old voices, so high and so quiet, would take a dog trotting between the stacks to hear them. And trot you did. Zachary Oxman's image of Ray Bradbury will now watch over the successor to that library, standing here on the site of Bradbury's Central School, connecting the twin joys of reading and learning that he once experienced here in the heart of his hometown. 
To Ray Bradbury, the great gift of the public library tradition in this country is that access to the great books of the world is free and open to everyone. That freedom meant everything to him and to all who have read his stories and books. This privilege of access goes hand in hand with freedom of the imagination. And as we move deeper into the 21st century, Ray Bradbury's legacy remains synonymous with that freedom. Each time he entered the library as a young boy in Waukegan, he saw the authors themselves personified in the masterpieces on the library shelves. Eventually he came to see the shelves as populations of authors and began to dream of living among them. To burn the book is to burn the author and to burn the author is to deny our own humanity. This statue is a permanent reminder that across the nation and beyond, Waukegan's native son stands for freedom of the imagination, for the precious gift of literacy, for the preservation of libraries, and for our dreams of reaching the stars. His space age dreams became our dreams too, and our special guest's presence here today is testament to that fact as we begin to turn to the prospect of journeying beyond near-Earth orbit once again. Ray Bradbury was a frequent guest at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and traveled to most of the NASA space flight centers. As the years passed, he was excited to see men and women of all races and all ethnicities engaged in the quest for space exploration. Ray Bradbury was an inspiration to the astronauts of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions, meeting and spending time with many of them. Bradbury was in JPL's mission control for Mariner 9's orbital insertion around Mars in 1971, for the Viking 1 Mars landing in 1976, and for many other deep space milestones. He spoke before the Presidential Space Commissions of Presidents Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush the Phoenix Lander in the high northern latitudes of Mars carries a digital copy of the Martian Chronicles. If only we had taller been, the Bradbury poem engraved beneath this statue reminds us of his most cherished belief. The Apollo missions represented the greatest achievement in the deep time history of this planet. In early August 2012, just two months after Ray Bradbury's passing, the nuclear-powered Mars rover Curiosity landed in Gale Crater, just below the Martian equator. Two weeks later, on his birthday, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's rover team named Curiosity's touchdown point Bradbury Landing. A simple name, evoking the small-town world of Dandelion Wine, where anyone might expect to find a point along the north shore of Lake Michigan called Bradbury Landing, a good place to fish, or perhaps journey out beyond the side of land to explore new horizons. Thank you. And who is our special guest tonight? He'd like to offer greetings to you. It's James A. Lovell, Jr., retired United States Navy captain and former astronaut. He was a naval aviator of distinction. In preparation for the Apollo lunar missions, he crewed Gemini 7 in 1965 with Frank Borman, a long-duration mission famously remembered by many of us as uh, the rendezvous with Gemini 6 as mission 76. Gemini 12 in 1966, he commanded with Buzz Aldrin. He was command module pilot and navigator for Apollo 8's lunar orbital mission with Frank Borman and William Andrews, a mission that proved the capabilities for the landing missions to the moon that followed. He commanded Apollo 13 through its dramatic return trajectory to Earth after a fire crippled the life support systems and prevented the lunar landing. Captain Lovell was the first astronaut to complete four missions in space, one of only three to travel to the moon twice. A small crater on the Earth 
side of the moon for Ray Bradbury was named by Apollo 15. But another crater on the far side of the moon is named for Jim Lovell, facing out to the solar system that Ray Bradbury so earnestly wanted to explore. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings tonight from Captain Lovell. work that I had read and never thought that I'd participate in it, uh, but then what he fantasized in those years suddenly became reality to me in the space program. Uh, it's uh, really something that is, uh, I'll, I'll of course always remember, and I think that Ray Bradbury was a, a good part of the history, as the instigation, is the motivation to actually have a space program. So we went from fantasy of Ray Bradbury's books to reality of our space program. Thank you. Let's have one more round of applause for Captain Lovell. I just can't get over the, the fact that we're here tonight on a night when there's not a cloud in the sky. And in a few minutes we'll be able to see the stars. It's just, it's like Bradbury planned it this one. Thank you very much. Uh, coming up next, our master storyteller in Waukegan, <laughs> Megan Wells. She has kept Ray Bradbury's words vibrant in Waukegan as the artistic director of the Ray Bradbury Storytelling Festival for the past 13 years. So let's hear her story. Yes. What a night. I grew up in Lindenhurst. Anybody here from Lindenhurst? So when my family said, let's go downtown, they didn't mean Chicago. They meant Waukegan. So I read books at that Carnegie Library. I, we could not take them home from the library here at Carnegie. It was too far to get them returned on time. <laughs> what I'd like to do is tell you one of Ray Bradbury's story, a short story called The Gift. Tomorrow would be Christmas. And even while the three of them rode up to the rocket port, the mother and the father worried about their boy this would be their first flight for him, his first flight into space, the very first time that he would ever be in a rocket ship, this rocket ship to Mars. They wanted everything to be perfect. So when at the customs table, they were forced to leave behind their son's Christmas gift, and the little Christmas tree with the lovely white candles because they exceeded the weight limit by just a few ounces. They felt deprived of the season, deprived even of their love. They had left their boy waiting in the terminal and so now his mother and father walked toward him. They whispered to each other, what shall we do nothing, nothing, there's nothing to be done. Rules, silly rules, I know. <laughs> oh, he really wanted the little Christmas tree. And then the siren sounds with a great alarm in the terminal and all the passengers line up 
Line up to board the rocket to Mars, up the gangplank, one by one, two by two, is touch sullen mother and father wait until the last of the line with their pale boy between them and father leans to mother and says I'll think of something what says the boy something about what what was there to say they slipped <clears throat> into their sleeping pods accepted chemical sleep, and the rocket took off, flung itself into deep space, leaving fire behind, leaving the earth behind, leaving earth time behind. They had left December 24th, 2052, but now there were no minutes, no hours, no days, no months, no years, so when the pods opened, it was only 11.30 on their New York watches. <laughs> Father, groggy in his pod, wondered at something. What? At the edges of his brain. What? What? Was it a memory? No, no. Was it a dream? There's no dreaming in this chemical sleep. No, it was something that someone had said on the gangplank as they were coming up into the rocket. And he knew it, and he had it, and he looked at his watch, and he turned to his boy, and he said, half hour till Christmas. Oh, said Mother, slightly dismayed. She had hoped he wouldn't mention it, that the boy just might forget all about it. No, no, said Father. It's almost Christmas. Is it? Is it? Can we put up the tree now? Can we put up the tree with the lovely white lights and my gift? Will I have my gift at midnight? Yes, said Father. That and more. I go see about it. But, but, said Mother. No. I'll be back. And Father was gone. 20 minutes and he came back and he said come on boy and he took his son's hand and he led son and wife out from the sleeping barracks down a long hall up a ramp down another hallway there to a cabin door and he knocked three times then two for a code the door opened it was dark the sound of people inside it's Dark, said the boy. Yes. Take my hand. Father grabbed son's hand and mother on the other side. Come on, mama. And in they went. And the door closed behind them and they were plunged into darkness. But for one light, one light ahead of them in this cabin, this space, this room, like a great eye. The boy gasped, mother and father gasped too. The father said, Merry Christmas, son. Did the boy hear him? Did he hear the officer singing behind them familiar Christmas carols? We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. He just walked to that gleaming eye. A porthole, six feet wide, four feet high, a window out into deep space. He placed his face up against that cold glass. He looked for a long time, for a very long time out into the dark night, into that gift of stars, that burning, burning of a billion lovely white candles. <coughs> the gift by our Ray Bradbury.
I could read like that, they would give me more than a minute 30 for my stories. <laughs> You know, it's starting to get dark now, and I remember uh, in the 60s, I think, when I was growing up here and a, a teenager, it was about this time each uh, weekend night that we would come downtown and scoop the loop. Do they still do that here? Yes. Yeah, it's unbelievable. All right. Our next guest, uh, Richard Lee. And Mr. Lee is the co-chair of the Ray Bradbury Statue Committee and the retired executive director of our Waukegan Public Library. Richard? I know, another speaker. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. You know, co-chair means that there was another person or two with me and and it doesn't say that I do this, but I'm, I'm going to introduce the other co-chair, Lori Nierheim. Lori? Yeah. A little over five years ago, King Bogdala <laughs> invited me to lunch at Louie's, right here in Waukegan. She said he had an idea he wanted to talk over with me. A little bit ago, um, I talked to Mike Rodriguez, and he said, yeah, I got a call like that, too. <laughs> Anyways, to borrow a, a phrase from statute committee, there he came. He said, Hank was always full of good ideas. So I sat down with Hank and his wife, Beverly, and Hank told me about his dream of seeing a statue of Ray Bradbury in downtown Waukegan. Not only that, he said, like the statue of Jack Fanny just down the block, we need to form a committee to get it done and I was just the person to chair it. I said, thanks. <laughs> Hank had a great, I, he had a great deal of foresight and he understood the importance of Bradbury's legacy, as did everyone else on the Ray Bradbury Statue Committee. I'm so glad that his vision has come to fruition and I know we all wish that he were here to see Zachary Ackman, Zachary Oxman's incredible work. When we formed the committee, bringing together community and arts leaders from all over Waukegan, we had two goals, to honor Ray and his legacy, as Hank intended, and to inspire Waukegan's youth to pursue their own captive creative ideas. We selected Waukegan Public Library as the site of the sculpture in recognition of the importance libraries held in Ray's life. A passionate supporter of libraries, Ray knew from experience that plenty of future writers and creators lurk between the stacks of public libraries. Reading, exploring, growing, just as he did at the old Carnegie Library on Sheridan Road. In 2015, we issued an RFQ that resulted in over 40 submissions from artists around the world. From there, the committee narrowed it down to three finalists. The finalists were invited to present a proposal for the sculpture to the committee. We used a numerical <coughs> scoring system to make our selection and the choice was unanimous. After seeing Zachary Oxman's incredible dynamic and whimsical portrayal of Ray, we were all blown away. Here was a sculptor who created a work that would not just commemorate the legacy, legacy of his subject, but transform the space around it. You will see the result of that transformation tonight. We would not be here without generous support of our donors. Over 250 donors from around the world contributed to this project. Yes, around the world. Many chose, many close to home here in Waukegan, some as far away as Russia. Thank you. Your support of this project represents not just a gift to honor Ray, but an investment in Waukegan's Arts District to this new major work of art. A project of this scale could not have been completed without the incredible support of the City of Waukegan, and in particular, the City Council, Office of the Mayor, the Building Department, Public Relations, and Public Works. I'd also like to acknowledge those contractors who so generously donated their services to this project. Stuckey Construction Company, served as our general contractor, did all the concrete work. Dynacoil made the 
fantastic stainless steel cap you're going to see. Product architecture did what architects do. Meco Steel Erectors uh, brought their crane in and an operator alongside, alongside Townline Design and Jewel Electric Company who put in the final lights here and the rest of the landscaping and the hardscape. These companies worked tirelessly over the past two weeks battling rain on the installation of the sculpture. I would also like to thank Evelyn Larson Ford for sewing the unveiling cloth. Yeah. Somebody had to do it. On behalf of the committee, I'd also like to recognize the library staff members who have worked hard over the past five years to support the committee, including Amanda Civitello, Marketing and Communications Manager, Kim Vanderyant, Donor Relations Coordinator, Alicia Garcia, Development Manager, and Jennifer Hare, Graphic Designer. So many wonderful people came together to make this a reality for Waukegan and to honor Ray, and it's wonderful, it's wonderful to see so many of you here this, this evening. And a special thanks to the Waukegan Symphony Orchestra. Their music will be the perfect accompaniment as we unveil the sculpture. At this time, I'd like to invite members of the Ray Bradbury Statue Committee to join me and Captain Lovell in unveiling this sculpture. Thank you, thank you all so much. This has just been an incredible evening. That was that was a moment for me too. Um, that was uh, that was pretty fantastic. Um, 
So, hello everyone and thank you Waukegan for coming out and, and sharing this very special event together. I'm both honored and humbled for having the opportunity to create Fantastical Traveler for your town. I do also... I I do have to add also for me a, a special uh, thank you for having our real world uh, fantastical traveler in our midst with Captain Lovell here tonight. It was a real privilege and honor to get to meet you and, and just thank you so much for everything you've contributed to our nation.